Hello, I'm Nancy Scott. As Interim Dean of the School of the Arts, I am thrilled to welcome you to our new faculty lecture series, which is being filmed at VCU's Institute for Contemporary Art. Our first presenter features Professor Stephen Vettiello, Chair of the Department of Kinetic Imaging. Stephen is a superb electronic musician and media artist whose sound installations have been presented at the 2002 Whitney Biennial, the 2006 Biennial of Sydney, the Cartier Foundation, Mass MoCA, and in public art spaces around the world. He often collaborates across disciplines working with award-winning artists, dancers and choreographers, novelists, poets, and even a biologist. His collaborators have included Nam Jun Paik, Tony Auersler, Pauline Oliveros, and many other distinguished cross-disciplinary artists. Stephen has been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship for Fine Arts, a Creative Capital Award for Emerging Fields, and in 2010, an Alper Ucross Residency Prize for Music Composition. In his talk, Professor Vettiello will be discussing the interdisciplinary power and potential of audio and visual art and the possibilities for collaboration at VCU Arts. I invite you to submit your questions at any time using the question and answer function. Before we begin, I want to extend my gratitude to the Institute for Contemporary Art for their support of the VCU Arts inaugural faculty lecture series. Please join me in welcoming artist, professor, administrator, and my colleague, Stephen Vettiello. All right, thank you very much to Dean Scott for that introduction. And I have a small but very socially distanced audience here and I'm incredibly grateful. And I love this theater. I wish more of you were here. The ICA Theater is one of the most beautiful spaces for performing in Richmond for, and to speak here is an honor. Listening to Dean Scott's introduction, I got really nervous that I needed a joke to open. I had this flash memory of being in a faculty um, search committee meeting with Professor Emeritus Martha Curtis, and she was staring at me and she suddenly went, I just realized you were quite funny, but it takes me a long time to understand. So if, if I'm lucky enough to say something funny and you laugh five minutes later or the next day, um, you're probably not the only one. In any case, I'm gonna talk about various projects that I've done, um, primarily collaborations. I often focus on site-specific sound installations and kind of my solo path. But with this, I wanted to talk about a lot of what was my own education through collaboration with some incredible artists. Um, and as Dean Scott mentioned, they have been visual artists, they've been dancers, they've been choreographers, they've been poets, novelists, uh, a biologist. One of my best collaborators at the moment is Dr. Casey Fellerfin, a biologist who listens to plants, uh, or to insects, sorry, through the stems of plants and has introduced me to sounds that I've never heard and many people have never heard. First artist who ever invited me to collaborate with him was Tony Ausler. Um, Tony asked me to work on an installation at the Worldwide Video Festival in The Hague in Holland in 1989. And up until that point, I had played in rock bands. I kind of fantasized about making soundtracks for visual artists. I didn't even know what that meant. And I remember thinking, you know, Tony explained to me that there would be a room full of objects. This was before he made the dolls that he's most famous for. Um, there would be a room full of objects. There would be lights on the chandelier with little video monitors. There would be a gargoyle um, with the, the voice and face of the great Tony Conrad. Um, and I should think about a soundtrack for this. And I didn't even know how, like, how do you do that? How do you compose for all these things? What if they don't line up? What if they're out of tune? And he very generously helped me with the idea of none of that mattered. The theme was, was important. The space was important. If multiple tapes overlapped differently every time, that's great. 
if sometimes it's chaotic, sometimes it's dissonant, sometimes it's pretty, all the better. And so we made each element of the soundtrack was on a different loop of a different length. And every time you came in, you heard it and saw it differently. And to me, in my career, that's the most important thing is how much what you hear will change your perception of what you're seeing, what you're feeling, the space that you're in. So I'll share you a little bit of documentation of Cryptcraft. It's rough, it was the video camera of 1989, but it's a project I'm so proud of and probably few people know. Just for the sake of time, I will click quickly. But um, Tony Ausler is still an amazing artist. My wife, Tracy Leipold, is in probably more than 60 or 70 of the dolls that he made um, in the 90s. And I continue. I've still collaborated with him quite recently. Um, project I'm most well known for, for probably, hopefully, the right reasons and unfortunate reasons. Um, reasons that had nothing to do with what I would have known at the time is the World Trade Center recordings. I had a World Views residency through the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council in 1999 and six months to spend 24-hour access in my studio in the World Trade Center. Um, the basic thought for me was to take the sound from outside, inside, and really that was where I understood what it was to be my own artist as kind of a room of one's own without the Virginia Woolf and gender, gender twist on this, but just to say that this is really where I went from being a soundtrack and kind of collaborator to my own, my own artist. In the six months that I was there, uh, it took me about two months to figure out how to get sound because the windows were sealed shut and eventually hit on contact mics. The first sounds I ever heard were church bells. I never heard them again. Later I heard cars crashing boats on the Hudson River. Um, there was a giant bird of prey once outside the window in this kind of magical moment that was also never repeated. There was times I heard the building sounding like an orchestra tuning up. And the recording that most people have heard if they know this project was the morning after Hurricane Floyd peaked. It was the strongest, or second strongest uh, hurricane to hit New York in the 90s. And it was the only time I ever walked into the space and could actually hear the building moving. I could hear what was outside, even without my microphones. And just to give you a taste. about an eight minute recording. I had all these DAT tapes, little digital audio tapes, and would record and sometimes tape over them because I think oh, I've recorded a lot of airplanes going by, you know, things that I had no idea how much. I mean, I'm glad I archived what I did archive, but I also wish I had saved more of the moments. Um, that, that residency and that project led to invitations in the art world. At that point, I thought I wanted to be a musician and dreamed of a record contract. 
I ended up making a record in that residency called Bright and Dusty Things for New Albion. Um, Pauline Oliveros performed on the, on the album with me. But the raw recordings are, are also kind of vital to my own understanding of what I could do as an artist and became valuable to people as a way to hear the building, as a way to hear something that no longer exists. Through invitations, I ended up getting invited to other shows. This was at Sculpture Center in Long Island City. Uh, I, installed, I installed it with help from an amazing studio visit from Vito Akanchi, who, Fear of High Places, the name of this piece, partially came from climbing with Vito 40 feet up to the ceiling of Sculpture Center, looking down, um, looking up. Uh, and it became a kind of form of, of a number of pieces that I made with inaudible sound frequencies, so there was sound, but you couldn't hear them, but you could see the surfaces of the speakers moving. Uh, Yasu Notone, the Fluxus artist, said it was the funniest piece he had seen in a long time. I still don't know what that meant, but for Fluxus, funny is good, so um, hopefully that was, I, mean, I always took it as a compliment. But I, I worked architecturally kind of adapting each one of these pieces to a space, and I thought I'd done enough uh, and Julie Maratou, I think one of the greatest painters alive, invited me to collaborate, and um, part of the collaboration became Julie reconfiguring this, the, the design of the speakers within this installation, which was at the Museum of Contemporary Art in uh, Sydney, Australia. And you know, every collaboration is different. When Julie asked me to work with her, I, I immediately thought, okay, you're a painter, your work is on the wall, it's fixed. You're also at a career level that I really look up to. What do you want me to do for you? And she said, no, no, it's something that we will do together that has to come together. And that, that was a gift. And it's, it's an important question for any collaboration is what is our roles? And any few, I mean, I've done over 100 collaborations. The very few that ever went wrong were because I didn't, or we didn't define our roles or someone changed their game. Um, but with Julie, I, she wanted my sound to influence her drawing. She made a wall drawing that was fantastic. Um, she wanted my wall drawing to influence her mix. And we did it in the space for 10 days in Sydney. We had a um, then grad student from painting and printmaking here at VCU named Saul Becker as Julie's assistant. I think he came as my assistant and then became Julie's assistant because what painter wouldn't want to work with her and, and she needed him. Um, and as I say, she, she took something that was mine, which was this configuration of speakers, and other artists have worked in similar forms, but a version that was mine, and she reconfigured them in a way that was, I think, you know, far more graceful and, and beautiful, and, and it was thrilling just to have that back and forth. And, and that, to me, is the joy of, of collaboration. Um, having moved from New York to Richmond, now being here 16 years, my social circles probably still remain through long-distance collaborations. Just real briefly, this is a project I did with Steve Roden in, in Marfa, Texas uh, in 2008. There was uh, a structure that we built. This is just the frame, and then this is the structure. We used solar panels. It probably seems really ugly, but in the middle of the desert, it was kind of joyful. We collected pieces of found wood from an old train station. Marfa, you probably know, is where Donald Judd's work is installed where the Chinati Foundation is, and a lot of the work is in the landscape. Uh, this was up for four months, powered by solar panels. Uh, we made a very quiet sound piece, which is in keeping particularly with Steve's work. And it just was out there, sometimes for crowds, sometimes buses pulled up, sometimes it was just for rattlesnakes and cows. Um, we would sit in there at night and the whole roof was broken and you could see shooting stars overhead. And it's you know, one of the collaborations I'll take to the end of my life with me in terms of experience and um, anything I've done with Steve is a pleasure. I mean, anything I've done with any of these people. This is um, the piece that was in that opening image. It's called Something Like Fireworks. I did uh, with a lighting designer named Jeremy Choate, who's now passed away. But Jeremy was a great collaborator. Uh, it was a work for the Davis Museum at Wellesley College. The title comes from something I'd read about synesthesia and a kind of blast of, of an impulse. And, and for some people, synesthesia might be hearing 
a sound, seeing a color, or seeing a color, hearing a sound, or smelling that turns into shapes, but some kind of a crossing of senses that happens. And um, we made this piece with a 20-foot lighting truss and something like 150 cues. Jeremy gave me the cues to me on a floppy disk. I was like, what do I, I'm never gonna need this. And then sadly he was killed soon afterwards and I don't think I'll ever do the piece, but I have the, the floppy disk as a, a strange little souvenir um, or archival element. Anyway, I'll just play you a little bit. never know it, but that piece was composed of a year of field recordings that were then manipulated, small bits and pieces, granular treatment to create a, a, I think it was a 16 minute composition, came out of multiple speakers around the room and the audience would lay on the floor and remember there was a, a brand new director at the museum and it was her first exhibition being presented. She was to be the first one, and she walked in in her new, like, you know, her, her very nice business suit, walked into the middle of the room, lay down on her back, and I felt like everybody just smiled and went, ah, it's, A, it's okay, which is a very comfortable way to listen to sound works and look at lights on the ceiling, but it's also something that I find with a lot of sound installations is that they, they kind of create an environment for the listener to be comfortable, and if you've got the right person, they find their space. Um, piece that I did that was on the High Line, actually for almost a year, it had to be one day less than a year, otherwise the city would have had to take ownership of it. It was called Bell for Every Minute. Uh, it was presented and organized by Creative Time, Friends of the High Line, and New York City Parks Department. I was up there, even before the High Line, probably people know that space, it's a beautiful space in, along the Hudson River in New York. But I was brought up first, I think in 2008, before the High Line was built, before the development was there, and asked to think about a project. And I had this kind of kinetic jolt of a moment where I was looking out at the Hudson River, and I remembered the bells that I'd heard in the World Trade Center, looking out the window, looking to the Hudson River. And I thought about a piece that could be done mapping the city through bells. Um, to do a public artwork in, in a space like that, you know, I, I, I don't want to dumb it down. I don't want to make something that appeals to everybody just so it will, but it felt like bells were something that could cross audiences. It wouldn't just speak to one kind of an audience or another. And, um, and it became a kind of fascinating, exciting archiving project. I spent about six or seven months, recorded 120 bells, and ultimately edited them down to 59 bells. At the beginning of the hour, all of them would ring together, and there would be this chaotic moment. I'll play it for you in a moment. And then after that, one bell every minute would ring. And you could go to this um, sound map, which is engraved and made of aluminum, and figure out, OK, at two minutes after the hour, this was recorded here. At 59 minutes after the hour, it was recorded here. And, and the bells went from religious to a little cat's bell to the um, McSorley's Owl House, I mean, um, Wall Street Stock Exchange all sorts of wonderful places. So I'll play this clatter, clung, clanging noise of what happened at the beginning of the hour. And 
and people would go, and, and it's nice because you could touch the bell and it doesn't leave any finger marks. Um, this was at the uh, United Nations, one of the bells I recorded. Another bell I recorded across from where the World Trade Center fell. Um, and just to hear it for a moment, they, I was invited out for, originally for a 9-11 ceremony because the bell was rung for each victim of, who died in 9-11. Um, and then they decided it would be better to invite me to come separately. And this wonderful um, sister nun met me in, in the chapel, didn't say anything except to follow her. We went outside and she rang the bell in the rain for three minutes and I'll just play a little bit of it. magic moment. I don't, you know, if you think that this was half a block off of Broadway, lower in Manhattan, traffic seemed to stop. There's a little bit of crackle. Maybe you can hear that was rain hitting off the, it wasn't, you know, tape problems. Um, and I remember, I mean, there's so many of these bells and so many stories. I remember I was getting a 5 a.m. flight to New York and ran into the then social media person from VCU Arts, and she said, well, but Stephen, aren't all the bells really the same? And I just thought, no, you know, they're so different. And standing in front of a five-foot temple bell at a Buddhist temple in Chinatown, feeling my whole body vibrate versus sticking my head to Boots the cat, um, Boots being the name of a cat who had a little bell and um, waiting for them to ding their bell. You know, each one had a beautifully different sound and a, and a culture and a life um, that I was just tapping into. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of conflicted, but I feel like I can only probably show a little bit of this, but it's online. Uh, this is a collaboration I did with the great poet Claudia Rankin and filmmaker John Lucas, who have also shown here at the ICA. Uh, this was right after the death of Trayvon Martin. Claudia contacted me. We had met at a UCross res residency, and she asked if I would do sound for a, a piece that she had written a poem in kind of response to the death of Trayvon Martin. And uh, John Lucas was producing a video piece. I see the video as being almost the ambient part of this. Uh, I hope that's no disrespect to the work itself, but I, I feel like the language in the poem is predominant. But Claudia asked me to work with elements of the streets, of perhaps sirens. I ended up, without her asking, I I think it was my idea, pulling in the 911 call from um, the reporting of Trayvon Martin's um, death and editing that in, as well as the, uh, President Obama, other voices. And an interesting thing, too, and then I'll get to it, is I mean, usually if the, the voice should be dominant and everything else would be almost invisible, Claudia really pushed me to have attention so that the voice and the, and the sound design were fighting each other. You know, and I kept thinking, but you were the great poet and I must back off. And she was saying, no, this is, you know, this is, it's, it's meant to be an ensemble. So I'll play it a little bit of it. It's, it's online and I'd encourage you to watch the full six, seven minutes. I felt whatever is happening is happening in front of me, but the police vehicle came to a screeching halt in front of me, like they were setting up a blockade. Everywhere were flashes, a siren sounding, and a stretched out roar. Get on the ground, get on the ground now. Then I just knew, and you are not the guy. 
but still you fit the description because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. I left my client's house knowing I would be pulled over. I knew, I just knew. I opened my briefcase on the passenger seat just so they could see. Yes, officer rolled around on my tongue, which felt like it grew out of a bell that could never ring its emergency because its emergency was the tolling I would have to swallow. In a landscape that was once an ocean bed, you can't drive yourself to sane. So angry you are crying. You can't drive yourself to sane. This motion wears a guy out. Our motion is wearing you out. And still you are not that guy. Then flashes a siren, a stretched out roar. And you are not the guy. But still you fit the description because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. I must have been speeding. No, you weren't speeding. I wasn't speeding. You didn't do anything wrong. Then why are you pulling me over? Why am I pulled over? Put your hands where they can be seen. Put your hands in the air. Put your hands up. Okay. Sorry to cut it short. It's, um, I mean, this was seven years ago. Being in Richmond, Virginia on this day, it feels like, you know, and, and, I mean, it's, it's more relevant than ever. Um, but it was just, you know, one of many kinds of collaborations, as, as hopefully you're getting a sense of as I move through these kind of speedily. Uh, sometimes, as in working with Julie Maritou, we're really functioning as equals. Sometimes with something like this, I was at the service of the project, but still given a lot of freedom and a lot of creative leeway. And I think when people ask me to collaborate, they come to me for what I do. It's not, I don't, I don't have the flexibility of a commercial artist. If, um, if she had said write a string quartet, I would have said I can't do that. Um, and I've had one or two commercial jobs that I've been fired for because people say, make a track that sounds like this. And I think, you're joking, right? And they're like, no, no, no. Um, the social network was a great soundtrack. Make something like that. And I just think, and that happens. I have a friend who does commercial work, and it happens every day. Um, Dean Moss is a choreographer who I've been working with for well over 20 years. He's based in New York. Uh, someone that I love working with, who generally has gives me a theme, some loose concepts. Uh, and this is a piece called John Brown. He'd done another work with the artist Leila Ali that was at the Museum of Modern Art that was specifically about John Brown, as I understand it. This was Dean's solo work in which he was taking ideas of John Brown, the abolitionist, but loosely. Um, Dean recorded his father, who was a civil rights leader. I believe he was the first black mayor of the city of Tacoma, Washington. Um, Dean grew up in the 60s in Washington, very much at the time a child of the civil rights. And um, working with him, the themes are generally are very loose. There's no illustration. There's no, it's about this. It's just, this is what I am thinking about. What are you thinking about? And so in response to thinking about Dean, thinking about John Brown, um, I would create elements. And so this is a little bit of a, a moment from this dance piece at the kitchen in New York City in 2014. Uh, you'll hear elements in my soundtrack. You'll hear, I believe, Dean's father speaking and some other layered voices. At being the first black mayor in the city of Tacoma. Being the first black person elected to the county council, and then to have been elected the chair of the council for three consecutive years. Nobody had ever done that. I, you make a living in New York. To be the first black person I made a living in, the in chair. my work of the association. External to my work, as opposed to external to yeah. yours, is how I can spend my money. I started writing about my experiences. What I started writing about my Oh, 
me now. You have recourse from employment discrimination. You have recourse from housing discrimination, health discrimination, educational discrimination. You have recourse to change. That's the real struggle. That's why I still call them a race man. That's why people, people who did not see it your way would want to get out of the way because you were an embarrassment to them. You constantly brought before them the conditions that they had. Most people will do anything and everything to get out of confrontation. Okay, three more projects. I'll say that Dean Moss was a visiting artist here at VCU Arts this past year. My department, Kinetic Imaging, in collaboration with the Department of Dance, brought him, and he was fantastic. Two of the grads are here, and I think would are smilingly nodding. Um, he was an amazing visiting artist. And he's a choreographer, but he also works with video. He works with objects. He's deeply socially engaged, and I think he spoke as well to the you know, visual and audiovisual artists as probably as he did to the dancers. And he's, you know, there's always that point when a good visitor comes and goes and you say, oh, I hope we have you back, but I'm, I'm certain we'll have him back and we'll be fortunate. Um, when, just in the introduction from Dean Scott, um, there was a mention that I've collaborated with a biologist. Casey Fowler Finn is someone I've worked on with uh, for several years now. She's a scientist based in St. Louis and does these magical studies of insects. This is a oak tree hopper, which is smaller than you know, my pinky fingernail. You would, and you would never know that those magical colors are there. You'd never even know it was in the tree. And when I'm out in the field with Casey, it's incredible because she'll just, you know, I'll keep walking and realize that she stopped five trees back and spotted a whole little family of teenage tree hoppers. Um, we use scientific instruments, not unlike the contact mic in that World Trade Center image I showed you, except that that contact mic cost $20. You can make it for $3. But we're working with scientific versions of that reading surface vibration, um, accelerometers primarily, uh, which is like if you think of a $1,000 version of a contact mic or a much more expensive laser. But capturing vibration, through the stems of plants, trees, and hearing the insects' vocalizations or uh, sounds that are coming through their bodies through the plant. And in this case, fortunately, to our recording devices. And one thing that I've learned from Casey is that 90% of insect sounds happening in the world are inaudible to us. So, I mean, like here in Virginia, we're hearing cicadas right now, and they're wonderful, but that's just the tiniest bit of the of the soundscape. Um, there's an exhibition that Casey and I did recently at St. Louis University's Museum of Art. Because of the pandemic, it went online, so we did an online version of the, the exhibition. And if you, if you look it up, it's too hot to sing.com. I'll put it in the um, comments, but it's too hot to sing.com. And it's, it's, there's some didactic information, some beautiful images. And then I made four compositions of the recordings we had done um, at different temperature settings, so from cold to medium to warm to hot. And this is a little bit of the sounds recorded at 23 to 28 degrees Celsius, which uh, uh, she, Casey considered, or Dr. Fowler Finn considers medium temperature. craziest, most wonderful moments of my last 10 years have been spent in fields of thorny bushes with headphones and going, what is that? 
And then she'll be sticking her head down into the shrubs and saying there's this little black bug with a, white, a, white, or a red stripe and it's doing that clicking and I don't know what it is. Um, we've heard the sounds of breathing coming from a, a cluster of moths. There's just, uh, there's so many sounds that it's, you, you know, I do my best to translate them into a work of art to be presented into a gallery. Um, but I think the magic is really just sitting there and hearing them and feeling very, very lucky. Okay, two more. Um, this past, just a year ago, I had a project in Poitiers in France. Uh, the artist Kim Suja had basically had her work throughout the city of Poitiers and commissioned a few artists to do site-specific pieces. She asked me to do uh, a project in this uh, baptism space that I believe is the oldest Christian space in Europe. And in, for a moment, I thought I was sort of overwhelmed by the, the architecture. But then a lot of events happened as I was planning this work that lined up. Uh, my mother died and wanted her ashes put into the water. My sisters and I put them into the water in Fire Island, and seven dolphins jumped out of the water. Uh, it's no, you can check my Instagram because my sister verifies that I didn't make this up. Um, there, we've, I'd obviously done a number of pieces about bells. I found out that there was a time after the space was used for baptism that the same space was used for melting down and making new bells. And I was doing a project in West Virginia and was trans in, in kind of exchange for information and access to this amazing world and the winds of Peter's Mountain, whole other project. I was transferring videos for a woman I met there and she was, one of them was of a, a man with a witching stick, a dousing rod looking for water. So I incorporated all of those elements as well as Virginia Woolf's The Waves. Uh, my wife Tracy did a, a bit of text reading and this is just a bit of footage from Kim Suja's iPhone, but to give you a sense. There's a documentary online with an interview with me, which I'm going to skip over because, oops, it's enough for me to feel nervous and awkward in front of all of you, but for me to watch me being awkward and nervous is too much. So um, last project I'll just mention is something that is still coming. Uh, I've been working on it for seven and a half years. It's a public artwork for the city of Seattle that will be on a floating dock uh, on Elliott Bay. And Public art is complicated. It's a, ple it's a pleasure and it's a privilege, but there is so much to negotiate. And at the point I was commissioned to do this, the highway was still up. They hadn't dug the tunnel. Tunnel machine broke and was sitting there for two years. You probably maybe heard about this on the radio, but there was so much to navigate. And the idea has been there all along, which was to have a piece that was basically played by the environment um, because it's meant to be permanent. It can't be a computer couldn't be speakers or speaker wires. So it, it occurred to me to make a kinetic artwork. And, I, um, and originally I had these bell-like instruments that were gonna be all on the ground face up and coming from naval salvage, I was told that we had to think about covering them, which seemed disastrous because people would throw garbage in them. Um, <laughs> which again is a thing of public art, is you're, you're not in control. I'll, I'll finish this piece in Seattle, fly back to Richmond and you know, see what happens. But it went through a lot of shifts. This is a drawing by Nicole Lee, who's a recent VCU grad from um, interior design, I believe. Uh, I, had a, I worked with a number of people helping me because I know what I want, but I don't always know how to, to draw very well or to um, visualize how things will work. And, Ultimately, I've also been working with, relying on an incredible engineer named Stuart Kendall, who's also working on the Long Now and some other projects. 
and Stuart's taken my idea of having the water and the energy of the, the, um, of the tides play it by designing the structure that will rise and fall as the dock rises and fall, and it, which is great with, with, with the intensity of the water there. And this is just a 3D rendering. Um, so those aren't real people and those aren't the real objects. Hopefully they'll look a little grittier and less shiny and, and um, less like, you know, whatever satellite dishes, but we made this for some structuring. So I'll just play you a little bit. This is the actual sound of the water, but the instruments I'm not actually gonna hear till I, I jump on a Zoom call on Thursday. <laughs> have to go back and, you know, when this is up, hopefully in September, but one we'll see and see if that sounds anything like it. It's just an approximation, but I, I'm hoping that it's a sound that will become part of the cityscape. I'm hoping it's a, part, a sound that people will be happy living with um, to make something for a public space. You know, it's, it's very easy to take over and, and something that I've, I've always strived for is something like the piece that was on the High Line, which is if somebody wanted to tune into it and listen, it was there. If they wanted to ignore it and be on their phone, talk to their friend, play frisbee with their child, I wouldn't get in their way. And, and you know, I think that sound is something that if you, if you want to tune into it, it's there for you. And if you care for it and you find a sound you like, it can make your, your, your life much better. So anyway, thank you very, very much. Um, thank you to the my socially distanced audience and for this honor of, of opening this lecture series. Thank you. <laughs>